Welcome to the next webinar in our training series. Now that you have a bit of project background, we're going to move on into the protocol and collection tips. This presentation will provide guidance to team leads and data collectors involved in collecting seed for Project Wingspan, and will provide information, protocols, and forms related to the project to standardize the seed collection process in order to ensure responsible collection and data integrity. One of our core goals with this project is to train volunteers in how to properly conduct a seed collection, and we hope that the skills you learn through Project Wingspan will transfer and enable you to contribute to community conservation projects into the future. Project Wingspan is a large project with a lot of moving parts, and as such, there are several tiers of responsibility to keep everything moving forward and ensure that no one person is saddled with all the work. Elizabeth Kaufman and I, Amber Barnes, are the Pollinator Partnership Program Leads, overseeing and organizing the program with the help of our core partners, as well as leading trainings and managing the seed collection and distribution effort. We are here to help answer any programmatic questions you may have. We also have state coordinators for each of our eight target collection states. These coordinators will be working directly with our volunteers to support and coordinate efforts within their respective state. They'll be in charge of identifying, organizing, and assisting with the training of our seed collection teams and are the go-to reference for our regional questions. They are actively coordinating with team leads and assisting with permitting and identifying potential collection locations. Team leads are the local on the ground volunteer leads throughout each state. State coordinators will set them up with a team and help them find a collection site if they don't already have one. From there, they will work with the state coordinator to obtain any necessary permits, familiarize themselves with our 34 target species, scout the site to identify populations, coordinate with their team to schedule and lead collection events. They may collect data and they oversee the drying and shipment of the seed to Mason State Nursery. Many teams have opted to have co-leads and divide the tasks, which has been very effective. Finally, we have our seed collection volunteers, which are responsible for learning our 34 target species, becoming familiar with the collection protocol, attending seed collection events, and submitting their volunteer hours online. If seed collection volunteers desire to be more involved, many team leads often welcome additional help with scouting locations, processing seed, and other tasks. Just reach out and let them know you're interested. It's extremely important that individuals collecting seed for Project Wingspan are well trained so that plant species are properly identified and plant populations are not harmed during the collection process and that the protocol is followed. Local training workshops and a training manual have been developed to aid team leads and volunteers as well as this online training module to provide our resources online and allow for additional volunteers to join collection teams throughout the span of the project. And Project Wingspan team leads and volunteer seed collectors can communicate with Pollinator Partnership at any time uh, to help get them in contact with their state coordinator or other regional support members. And while we will always prioritize wild seed collections whenever possible, we're also open to working anywhere with populations large enough for a collection. So collections may take place on private lands or public lands and lands managed by other federal agency, state, county, or municipal agencies, um, as long as the landowner permission is provided. And many groups, organizations, and individuals have joined this initiative to allow seed collection on their lands. And we welcome any connections you may have to um, groups uh, listed on this slide, such as conservation districts, um, farm bureaus, master gardeners, master naturalists, um, farm cooperatives, land trusts, parks and their friend groups, um, and any other connections that you might have that might be interested in participating. State coordinators have been working with partners throughout the state to find suitable seed collection sites. 
But if you have a site you think might be interested in participating as a collection location, please let us know. Team leads are welcome to make these connections themselves through their network, and we will supply you with a toolkit of resources. We have several documents to help explain what Project Wingspan is and links set up for people or organizations to sign up as seed collection sites volunteer, or volunteer seed collectors. If you'd prefer, you can also pass this information along to your state coordinator and they can reach out to the site to see if they're interested in participating. So, Obtaining permission to access property is a very important first step. You can never enter a site without first getting permission. And the, these forms will need to have on file for each collection. So if a seed collection will occur on state lands or rights of way, uh, a right of entry permit must be obtained as well as notification of your presence in regard to date, time, and total persons that will be on site. Right of entry permits can be obtained from district or county Department of Transportation offices or state park offices. But you need to plan ahead. You won't get a permit overnight. And if you're a team leader and you have arranged for your state coordinator to obtain your collection permit, you will need to have a copy of that permit on hand when you visit the site. Additionally, you'll need to sign a hold harmless document or a volunteer waiver um, and have one signed for each of the team members on your team. Uh, your state coordinator will be keeping track of that. So if you aren't sure if someone has turned theirs in, you can always get in touch with your state coordinator to make sure that everybody on your team has filled out their proper forms. And we've also created permission forms that can be used when a site doesn't have a specific permit process that needs to be followed. And these can be found in the seed collection manual appendices as well as the team lead toolkit we've put together to support our team leaders. So in order to set up a collection, the state coordinator and team leads will need to obtain the permission to enter the site and collect seed, but afterwards they can scout and assess habitats for our target species. In the next few slides, we'll go over how to scout and assess a site. So what makes a population? Well, for our program, uh, we consider a population to be a group of one species of plants living within the same collection site that are continuous in range and generally uniform in appearance. Bees can travel up to three miles and monarchs and some of our other large Lepidoptera can travel even further. And so that means that pollen is being exchanged within a three mile radius of your collection site. So if you need more seeds and you have the permission, you can look outside of your centralized collection location anywhere within that three mile radius and combine those um, seeds with your uh, main collection. And it's important to gain the most representatively balanced sample of seeds. So we wanna make sure that we're collecting from at least 50 plants, um, but in many cases, uh, we wanna prioritize sites that have much more than 50 plants. And those seeds should be, um, those plants should be collected from in an even and, and random method. Also, different collections of the same species um, should be at least a quarter mile apart to ensure that they are two separate populations. And this diagram illustrates the text from the last slide. So the red circles are the three mile radius that a large pollinator could travel from the center of your collection area. And that would be one collection of this yellow flower. If a few miles away, you know, a minimum of a quarter mile, there's another population of that yellow flower, that would be considered a separate collection of that species. And if you have a different species, let's say a blue flower, uh, that overlaps your two separate yellow populations, that is totally fine. There won't be any gene transfer between the blue and yellow flowers, so that can be a collection site for the blue flowers. And in fact, we encourage uh, seed collection sites that have multiple species of our target from our target plant list. And this can allow for um, multiple collections to occur and um, scouting and assessing for multiple species to happen at once. 
So how do you assess a population? Well, um, you may not need to do all of these steps. It will really depend on the location of the seed collection. When collecting from a park, a botanist or naturalist on staff may be able to complete many of these steps. And your state coordinator, site partner, and team lead will coordinate on these efforts and work out a plan. You don't want to show up at a site just to find out your species either aren't there anymore or have already gone to seed. So scouting is a really important part. And once permission has been gained, teams that have committed to collecting seed for Project Wingspan will need to begin by making site visits. Preliminary site visits are often necessary to assess populations, confirm the identification and or the location of specimens, and estimate the likely harvesting date and potential for seed production. The target population should have at least 50 plants from which a collection can be made. Um, but again, we prioritize any sites that will have many more than that. And this will ensure that adequate genetic diversity can be sampled from the population and that the seeds are likely to be at maximum viability and longevity. And again, it's important that a knowledgeable botanist conduct the preliminary site visits and is involved in identifying the plants and the most suitable populations for seed collection. Where populations are suitable and the quality and quantity of seed is adequate, it may be possible to make collections of multiple target species from the same site. Additionally, team leaders will know their volunteers best and can determine at the preliminary site visit if populations should be marked for their volunteer collection team to help them return to the appropriate area when the seeds mature. And so you'll want to check with the landowner and see if it's okay to mark populations either with flagging tape, pin flags, yarn, or something else. And uh, this is definitely recommended as um, the vegetation can change dramatically from spring to summer to fall. Uh, and finding a, a site in the late summer um, that you saw originally in the spring can be a little difficult. So it's advised to put some, some flagging or, or pin flags out whenever you can. Um, additionally, you know, as the estimated seed collection time gets closer, you want to scout again um, to ensure that um, the seeds haven't gone to, haven't been released yet. And then you can perform a cut test on the seed to determine the seed maturity and um, assess the amount of potential bug damage that was there. And we'll discuss the cut test in a little more detail further on. So is the seed ready? Uh, knowing how to see if the seed is ready for collection is important, uh, not only for our team leads, but also just for everyone on the team. Um, looking for, there are many different characteristics that you can um, look at to visually assess the seed. So first, you can look for changes in the fruit and seed color. Um, for instance, with these uh, two photos of Zizia aurea or Golden Alexander, you can definitely see the change in color of the, the younger plant, um, the immature green seeds to those mature brown seeds in that bottom photo. And fruits or seed pods um, should be splitting or breaking open. Um, you can also, if the seeds are in a uh, capsule, and they can be hard and dry, uh, they may rattle in there. And so you can use um, not only your touch and, and your sight, but also sound to assess whether or not the seeds are ready. And these seeds, as they mature, will become much harder and drier, and some seeds will have already dispersed. So a cut test is one method of determining if a seed is mature. Um, and you do this by cutting a seed open to look at those internal tissues and see if they're fully developed and undamaged. And this can tell the collector a few different things. It can let you know whether the seeds are mature enough, um, but it can also let you know if the seeds have been damaged. And this can aid in determining the amount of seed needed to be collected. So if you get to a site and um, you do a cut test and about 30% or greater of the seed uh, has been damaged um, and is not viable, 
that means that you might just want to move along and find a, a alternate collection site. Um, otherwise, if the this location has um, hundreds of plants, uh, you can just increase the number of plants that are collected from and um, in order to compensate for those non-viable seeds that will be collected. So how to perform a cut test? You can cut longitudinally on a firm surface and you can use a, a razor blade and push downwards and get a nice cross section to examine the contents of the seeds. And there's also more field friendly techniques such as uh, utilizing some masking tape and uh, nail clippers and sticking the seed to the tape and clipping at the seed. And then the tape will hold down um, part of the seed so as you clip, um, both sides don't fly away. Uh, but that can be a, a nice alternative to conducting a seed cut test in the field. And not all uh, of the seeds will be conductive for a seed cut test. Um, some of them are very small. And that's when you'll utilize more of those uh, visual assessments. So a mature seed will usually be based on the presence of a, a fully developed embryo. It'll have, again, the seed will change, that outer seed coat will change color, often it will darken. Um, and uh, in many cases, the seed will be more plump, um, even with a flat seed, you can usually see where there is a, a fully developed embryo versus um, one that hasn't. An immature seed, on the other hand, uh, will often be a lighter, um, maybe greener or yellower in color, have a softer outer seed coat, and that inner tissue can tend to be milky and just generally not as firm as an immature seed. And then an empty seed is likely the result of insect damage or um, failure to fully uh, mature or become pollinated. And so these can tend to be slim or empty when you cut them open. So in order to reduce the likelihood of contamination by, of our seeds uh, by insects, fungus, or other undesirable factors, it's important to only collect the seed heads, seed pods, and the seed itself whenever possible. And, and so, you know, that's what you want to go in the bag, those seed pods, um, seed heads, or the seed itself when that can be directly taken off of the plant. So what doesn't go in the bag? Uh, while it may seem silly to list weeds on this list, we definitely know that our collection volunteers are environmental environmental stewards and would not intentionally contaminate our collections with this kind of seed. But there are many ways you can accidentally allow seed, weed seeds into your bag. And so a couple examples of ways to prevent this would be to keep your bag closed when you're walking through a site from one plant to the next. And what this does is it prevents any um, seed that you bump into from, from other plants from dropping into your bag as you're moving through the site. Um, if you're collecting with two hands, um, such as in a, this photo, uh, just you know, watch your periphery. Um, be mindful of where your head is and where your elbows are and uh, ensure that nothing um, weedy could be bumped into that could be falling into your bag or, or bucket. You also want to be mindful of your clothing and make sure that uh, if weed seed get onto your sleeves while navigating the site, that you brush them off before putting your arms back into your bag. Um, and please do not collect any excess materials such as stems and leaves when possible. Um, and when stems are necessary in the case of a fluffy seed that might get blown away, uh, please remove them before shipping to the seed cleaning facility. We want to avoid, again, any um, fungus or stem or leaf nesting um, or burrowing insects and um, that kind of contamination. So making sure to keep out those woody materials, stems, branches, and leaves will increase the viability of the seed. And no collection is ever going to be insect-free. 
uh, but you can do your best to avoid plants that appear to be infested with insects. And Mason State has expensive seed cleaning machines, and it's important that no rogue materials accidentally get included with the seed and inserted into their machines. So please make sure that all tools are accounted for um, and we're not set into the bag for safekeeping uh, or to weigh it down and, and forgotten. Um, and so, you know, this not only can prevent Mason State from accidentally uh, getting some small stones or, or personal items um, sent to them and put into their machinery for cleaning the seed, but this also saves our team leads time as uh, personal items might get set into a bag, again, for safekeeping or, or weighing it down, um, and then having to figure out who that belongs to um, by the next collection. So it's just best to um, keep those items out of your bag or bucket or if you do need to set them in there for safekeeping, make sure that they are fully removed before turning um, that bag or, or bucket into um, for a combination of the seed. And um, we can't stress the uh, avoidance of weeds enough. Uh, if a collection is found to be contaminated with weed seeds, it will need to be destroyed and discarded to ensure that this program does not accidentally spread weeds. And we don't want all the hard work that goes into scouting, planning, collecting, and cleaning the seed to go to waste. So please be careful about what you pick and that your bag or bucket isn't under a weed when you're collecting your target species. So now that we've discussed um, how to scout a site and assess a site and you know, what gets collected, uh, how do you, what are the best management practices for collecting seed? Well, um, we are follow the uh, Bureau of Land Management's Seeds of Success program recommendation of collecting no more than 20% of an individual plant's reproductive output in the year. And so, you want to collect you know, 20% and leave that other 80% um, to the landscape. We need to be good stewards and ensure that we're not negatively impacting our collection site in order to help the monarchs and rusty patch bumblebees. So we wanna leave that 80% of the seed to perform its natural ecosystem function of reseeding the populations, providing habitat and feeding wildlife. Um, so as you collect, you, you want to make sure that you're collecting widely throughout the whole site. So you don't want to stay in one small area, even if there's a fantastically dense patch of, of 50 plants. Uh, those plants might be related. And so you want to make sure that you're travel, walking throughout the site and um, collecting thoroughly throughout that area. Um, you also will want to make sure that you are um, including plants that are in different microhabitats. So you want to collect as broadly as possible and be collecting the most diverse selection of material. And that can be in wetter areas or drier areas or, or steeper areas. And you don't want to only collect um, hip high. You want to look higher and lower and don't avoid scraggly plants and only focus on the lush plants. We want to get broad genetic representation in the collections. And that scraggly plant may have important characteristics which will help it flourish under other conditions. It's wetter, drier, or warmer conditions than what's in play that year. You also want to watch where your team members are and don't collect from the same spots. It's best to spread out first and then collect on your way back so you can over, avoid over harvesting. And um, there's different methods for how you can collect 20%. You can either collect uh, all the mature seed from one out of every five plants you come across, um, or you can collect 20% of the mature seed on every plant you come in contact with. And technique will likely vary for the different species. While we'll go into more detail on how to collect seed from each species in the Plant ID webinar, the next few slides will cover some of the basic techniques and provide guidance on how you can collect seed heads, seed pods, and seed itself from our target species. 
When collecting from some plants, such as Oenothera biennis, or the common evening primrose, you'll notice that the plant flowers from bottom to top. This can result in a situation like the one pictured here on the right, where the capsules at the bottom of the stalk are ripe and ready for harvest, while those at the top are still green and immature. And that's fine. You can go about this in two ways. Either come back at a later date when the whole stalk is ready for collection, or you can remove the bottom capsules from the stem, which are ripe and ready, and place those into your collection bag while leaving the rest of the capsules in place to mature and naturally disperse. Either way, just make sure you remember to only harvest 20% of the available seed from that population. Other target species on our list, such as Monarda fistulosa, or wild bergamot, which is pictured here, have single seed heads or pods on a stem. These are some of the easiest to collect. Simply cut off the seed head or pod and place that into your collection bag. Some plants, such as Liatris in these photos, use the wind to disperse their seed. Species that use this mechanism have a fluffy pappus, which are scales, bristles, or feather-like hairs that are attached to the seed, like a dandelion. This fluff acts as a parachute, and if you're not careful, will help your seeds fly away and evade collection. When collecting from species that utilize wind dispersal, it's easiest to cut off the entire seed head from the stem and place this into your bag. Once you're in a sheltered area from the wind, you can separate the seeds and fluff from the stem. Mason State Nursery can isolate the seed from the fluff and chaff at their facility, but please remove any stems, leaves, or stalks before shipping. Finally, some species such as Zizia aurea or Golden Alexander, which is pictured here, have exposed seed that's not in a capsule or a pod. For plants like these, the seed readily falls off the stems once it's ripe. To harvest this in the field and not accumulate excess plant matter, you can gently cut the top of the seed head off, hold it over your bag, and loosen the seed off with your fingers. The seed will fall into your bag and you can just leave the stem behind. As mentioned before, we'll cover ID and collection tips for each of our target species in the next webinar in this series and there's also in-depth information on how to harvest seed for each species in the seed collection manual. While these few slides don't cover every seed dispersal mechanism from our plant list, we hope this short primer helps to provide additional context to these other resources which will be provided. And please remember to be good stewards to the site and collect no more than 20% of the population's seed harvest for that year. So how much seed is in an ideal collection? Well, the goal for each collection is a minimum of one ounce of clean seed. The thoroughly cleaning, testing, cataloging, and handling the seed is very time consuming work. And our partners at Mason State Nursery recommend that a uh, collection result in at the very least one ounce of clean seed. Um, collection resulting in larger than an ounce are definitely encouraged whenever possible. And here are a few photos to illustrate what an ounce of a few of our target species looks like with a can of pop for a size reference. Now, once you begin the seed collection process, you'll need to carefully examine a small representative sample of seeds to make sure that they have a fully developed embryo. You can cut the seeds open with a knife and examine them with a hand lens um, or those uh, pair of nail clippers in the field to be extra certain. In general though, seed will be dry, dark, and relatively loose in its shell if it's ripe. You'll want to collect mature dry seeds that are relatively insect free and put in paper, uh, brown paper bags. Large collections can be made using uh, plastic buckets and then transferred into bags. You want to make sure that you have a, a good breathable um, substrate to hold those seeds in. And if you're unsure if the seed is actually ripe, you can collect twice, um, a little bit earlier and a little later to ensure that you've got um, a good mix of uh, mature seeds in there. And make sure to remember to take care of your seeds after they're collected. Uh, 
Uh, you don't want to allow collections to overheat. You don't leave them in a vehicle in full sun. Exposure to sustained high temperatures can badly damage seed collections. Maintain ventilation around the collections at all times and try and park the collecting vehicle in the shade or at least cover the windshield if they need to sit in there for a short amount of time. While damp uh, collection should not be made from seeds that are wet after a storm and um, they should definitely wait until the morning dew has burned off. Um, but if your seed does have some dampness to it, um, they should be dried uh, as immediately, as, as quickly as possible to avoid any uh, mold or mildew growing on the seeds. It's very important to remember to label the seed um, bags in the field. Whether you attend to or not, uh, you'll likely forget pertinent information before you get back to the car or office. And this information should be recorded on your field data sheet, which we'll cover in a moment, but also on the um, collection bag. And this is especially vital if you're doing multiple collections um, from the site in the same day. And uh, on this slide, you'll see some of the information that we need to be on the collection bag. And this is also covered in detail in the seed collection manual. And finally, you will need to take pictures of the plants throughout the collection process. Digital photos should be taken at the landscape level of the individual plant and of the materials collected. Photos should be labeled with your unique collection ID number and submitted through the Survey123 application. You're welcome to take these photos with your mobile device, and that will make them easier to input into the GIS app. And we'll go over Survey123 in a little bit more detail later, but specific directions are also available in the training manual, and there will be a webinar on the Project Wingspan website. We also need information about the, the collection event, plants, and site collected using the field data sheet. The field data form, like the GIS app, should be filled out while in the field. Each unique collection of a species will get its own form, and even if multiple species are collected at the same time. However, if a site is revisited and the same species is collected from that same site, but on a different day, in order to get additional seed, um, that information can just be added onto that original data sheet without creating a new record. And again, this would happen if not enough seed was mature at the first visit and a second visit was necessary to collect from that same population. And this will help keep everything organized and collect vital information about the collection site and species present. A copy of this sheet will be sent with the seeds to the cleaning facility for cataloging and a copy will be kept by a team lead for their records. And please use the collection tracking sheet to stay organized. Um, this will be a master list that will help you know what your collection ID should be for your next collection. And this will help um, keep track of collection dates and shipping dates, as well as avoiding accidental duplication of that identification. Project Wingspan uses a seed collection reference ID number format to keep all of these seed collections separate. Um, as we said in the, the background, we will be collecting a thousand uh, collections throughout our six state region. And so staying organized is really important for helping Mason State Nursery be able to uh, properly catalog all of these seeds so we can make sure that they are getting back to the right locations. The Project Wingspan teams will be using a special format to identify their collections called the Seed Collection Reference Number. And it will include three parts. The Seed Collection Team Reference ID, which is your state abbreviation and collection team number. The Project Site ID, ID which is represented by letters A through Z. And the collection number. Seed collection reference numbers will be unique and sequential from year to year and will never be repeated. If the last collection from a previous year was 34, then the next year's collection number would start with 35. 
And the same goes for the project site ID. Each new site should be a unique and sequential. You'll be assigned a collection team reference ID by your state coordinator. And we have another uh, graphic to help display this. So in this case, we've got Illinois Collection Team 1. They've done three collections from two different sites. And you can see that uh, there are two different species at Site A. So Illinois Collection Team um, 1 went to their first site of the season. So that'd be Site A. And they did their first collection of the season, so Collection 1. And they then later went back to that same site and collected from a different species. So their collection site is the same, but their collection number um, has sequentially gone up. And then they discovered another population of their uh, yellow flower as they found at site A, but at a new site. And so um, that has become site B, and it's their third collection of the season of a unique population. Um, so it's Illinois Collection Team 1, Site B, Collection 3. And the field data form is a critical part of every collection. A copy of this form will be kept by the team lead for their records, and a copy will be sent with the seeds for cataloging of the seed at Mason State Nursery. Only the team lead or data collector will need to fill this out. And not only will this form give us vital information about the site and collection, it can also be used by team leads as a scouting sheet for future collections of target species that were observed while carrying out a collection. In addition, these documents will give team leads records of the species found at their collection site, approximate numbers of the plants, and directions on how to get there, which can be very valuable for future local conservation efforts. In Appendix B of the Seed Collection Manual, we have both a blank data form and an example one uh, filled out. And this slide has that mock data collection information that's included on that filled out example. So you can take a look and maybe pause here, fill out the data collection um, sheet and see if you filled it out correctly and do a compare and contrast. And, then you can take a look at that um, filled out example and see if everything matches up. And here's that filled out form for your reference as well. So even though you will not be collecting wet seed, um, seeds will just have some um, moisture still, still remaining in that plant material. And so even quote unquote dry seed will still need to be dried for at least three days prior to shipping. And so um, depending on the space that you have, uh, there are a couple different ways that you can dry seed. And um, one method is to lay out newspaper and spread the collection out about one layer thick. Um, and in utilizing a fan at its lowest setting, if it won't blow the seed away, can Gently blowing over the seed can expedite that drying process. You can auto also utilize a, an old screen on top of um, some buckets or boxes, and that can allow that air ventilation to come from both above and below. If you don't have space, um, what you can do is leave the seed in the bag, but you will need to leave the bag open and stir the seeds at least once a day and sometimes more often. Uh, again, a fan on its lowest setting, gently blowing over that bag would definitely be recommended and would help expedite that drying process. And with our seed list, um, as you'll see when you go through um, the seed collection manual and everything, um, geranium is one that you might want to keep in the bag um, so that as those uh, seeds dry out and the, the seed pod springs open, um, the seeds don't go uh, flying all over the place. And while we don't recommend you store the seed for long periods of time, um, you may need to hold on to them um, for a little while after collecting and drying them out um, in order to send them in bulk, uh, or if there's a, a holiday weekend or something going on and 
and you know the post office isn't accessible for for shipping them off so if you do need to hold on to them for a little while there are some best management practices for storing your seeds first of all you want to make sure to um, get them fairly clean you know make sure that you're removing all all remaining chaff uh, ensure that there aren't any stems or seeds um, stems or leaves uh, in there because um, again that can provide um, a contamination of, of insects or mold or mildew um, and you want to make sure that you put that seed into a nice breathable um, paper bag and put that seed in a dry dark room with low humidity until they're able to be mailed. Uh, you should never freeze your seed um, but it can be good to uh, keep them a bit cooler. And if you uh, do move the seed from one um, bag to another, always make sure that that storage bag, um, that the labels and um, information about the collection gets transferred from one storage bag onto another. So now we'll discuss some of the other things you want to keep in mind, including safety concerns and controlling the spread of noxious weeds. So remember to be careful when uh, handling milkweed plants um, and some of the others, as the sap can be uh, damaging to your eyes or um, can be an irritant to sensitive skin. It's definitely recommended with um, if you have sensitive skin or uh, tends to touch your face a lot, um, to wear gloves and um, regardless of whether you're wearing gloves or not, you still will want to um, avoid, you know, contacting your face with your hands and your gloves and thoroughly wash your hands um, once you're able, just to avoid any um, sap or, or plant juices from getting um, onto sensitive skin. It's Definitely key to always remember to stay hydrated. We recommend um, having at least one liter of water available and uh, just keeping tabs and, and making sure to stay hydrated as you're out in the field and a potential, you know, some of these really hot days. That's really important. Uh, anytime you're collecting seed near a um, road, you want to make sure that you're wearing uh, bright clothes and um, also, contact your local Department of Transportation and see if there's any other um, protective equipment that's needed. And we don't recommend uh, collecting along busy highways. And um, in order, you will always want to check for ticks and chiggers before you um, get back into your vehicle. We recommend um, teams, you know, doing tick checks for one another. Um, but also, you know, tuck your pants into your socks, your shirt into your pants, and apply a bug repellent, insect repellent to your clothing um, to avoid those ticks from being able to uh, reach contact with your skin. And also, you're going to want to keep, be mindful of your surroundings and keep an eye out for poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, and wild parsnip while you're out in the field. In natural resource work, including seed collections, equipment and organisms are often moved from one location to another. And this provides the potential for the spread of non-target species to invade new habitat. And non-target species are the plants, animals, diseases, pathogens, and parasites that are not intended to be moved. As responsible environmental stewards, it's essential that we do our best to reduce our impact and prevent the movement of invasive and weedy species whenever possible. So here are some steps that we can take to ensure that we're being the best stewards to our sites. First, it's important to educate yourself. Um, learn to identify the problem weeds you may encounter. It's easy to learn to identify the problem weeds in most areas, and you can find a host of free identification guides wherever you are or wherever you're going. There are many websites available to learn about your local problem weeds and invasive species, 
you can check out your State Department of Natural Resources, uh, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, local um, park groups, and many other great resources out there. And you always want to make sure that you are coming to a site clean. So before leaving your home, take a little time to inspect your gear and remove dirt, plants, and seeds from clothing, boots, gear, and vehicles. One possible, wear low tread footwear that doesn't hold soils, seeds, plant parts, or invertebrates. And once you're at the site, you know, pay attention to your surroundings. You'll want to avoid parking in weed patches. Most weeds spread along roadways as vehicles can easily transport many types of weeds and seeds. So avoid parking in weedy spots whenever possible. You'll also want to avoid walking through weed patches to reduce the amount of seeds that you may be transporting as hitchhikers. And finally, you'll want to leave clean. So before you leave the site, carefully inspect yourself and your equipment at the end of your trip. Weed seeds will cling to most materials, so be sure to carefully check everything. Use items like a stiff brush, stick, or small screwdriver to help remove soils, seeds, plant parts or invertebrates. You can use boot brushes and boot picks um, or other removal devices when possible as well. You don't want to clean clothing, footwear, or gear in or near waterways though. It may promote the spread of invasive species downstream. Additionally, you can use a 70% alcohol solution to sanitize boots and equipment. So all seed collected for Project Wingspan will eventually end up at Mason State Nursery. And it's critical to the success of the seed that it's shipped shortly after drying together with the completed field data forms. If you're sending many different collections at once, it's recommended um, shipping in a sturdy cardboard box, um, such as these uh, United States Post Office um, priority mailboxes. And um, the Pollinator Partnership will be paying for the shipping. And so um, you can pick up these free United States Post Office priority mail flat rate boxes from um, any of your local uh, post office locations. Uh, you do not want to mail your seeds out on a Thursday or Friday. Um, so uh, because we want to avoid them um, being left out on uh, the weekend and potentially a hot mailbox or a doorstep in the, the sun or in the rain. So you always want to check the estimated delivery before mailing to ensure that the seed will arrive before the weekend. And it's important to send a copy of the field data form with each collection, um, but keep a copy for yourself. And this will make sure that as that seed is received at Mason State Nursery, they're able to catalog it correctly. The Pollinator Partnership, um, again, we will be paying for the shipping. And so uh, for a team lead that um, needs to complete this part of the process, uh, they will contact their state coordinator and get the login information so that they can log into the United States Postal Service website and um, be able to get into our project's shipping account. And um, detailed instructions for step-by-step uh, -step how to um, ship the seed can be found in the seed collection manual. Um, once you have paid for the postage, you'll print the label and securely tape it to the top of the box. And you can either hand deliver the package to any United States Post Office um, Service post office or schedule a pickup with your daily mail pickup if that's an option. Again, you want to make sure that the package is received by the post office worker the same day and um, make sure you're not running a few errands uh, beforehand and that those seeds aren't left in an uncontrolled, hot, or humid environment um, before you drop them off to the mill. And we've partnered with the Uni University of Arkansas Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies, or CAST, to come up with a mobile application to capture the geospatial distribution of our collections. CAST used the Survey123 for ArcGIS application 
to create a form that allows us to capture the GPS coordinates and other characteristics of each collection. And this goes into a secure database that will be used to help us redistribute the seed onto the landscape. It also functions as a library for photo vouchers to ensure that the correct species are being collected. These photos are also helpful for outreach and education about monarchs, rusty patch bumblebee, seed collections, and this project. It's important to note that this app serves as a separate purpose than the paper field data form, which is utilized by Mason State Nursery to keep the collections organized upon receipt. Detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to enter data into the app are provided in the seed collection manual, and you can also watch a short video on the training page for a tutorial. So not only is this important work, but it's also really fun. So please feel free to take photos and send us pictures of your collection teams in action. We can use these photos to promote the vital on the ground work that our volunteers are doing and raise awareness about the declines of the monarch butterfly, rusty patch bumblebee, and our other imperiled pollinators. One of the many important measures that a grant funding agency look at to judge the success of a project is community involvement or volunteer support. And this is important for us to understand the various affiliations and time spent by our volunteers so that we can report this back to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as an in-kind match of time. These records can also be beneficial for volunteers to track because in some states, depending on your income, you may be able to use this information as a tax write-off. This can also be a great way to track volunteer hours that may also qualify for other programs, such as master gardeners and master naturalists who need to track their volunteer hours. So next steps, if you're interested in becoming a team lead, co-lead, or data collector, please let us know. Your state coordinator is in the process of organizing collection teams and um, We'll be in touch soon to assign our various volunteers who are completing these trainings to the nearest team. Team leads will then introduce themselves to their team and contact them once the seed collection events are in the works. We'll continue to train new collection team volunteers and team leads with our online training module uh, to enhance the reach of this project. Thank you for joining us for this installment of the training webinar series discussing the protocol and collection tips. We greatly appreciate your interest in pollinator conservation and becoming a trained volunteer for Project Wingspan. We're excited to have you join our growing network of volunteers to help us make a tangible impact through on-the-ground conservation efforts and provide vital habitat for these imperiled pollinators. Once you've finished watching all the videos and wrapped up the other steps in the online training module, please don't forget to fill out the volunteer waiver and contact form for our training website. Once you've completed the contact form, that will notify your state's coordinator that you've finished the training and they'll be in touch with you shortly thereafter with next steps. Contact information for our state coordinators can be found on our website as well as on this slide. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. This wraps up the presentation of our seed collection protocol. To continue with your online training, please join Elizabeth Kaufman for our next video that provides an introduction and tips for identifying our 34 target plant species.